I've got sort of an interesting topic this morning uh, that I was asked to address. Uh, it's an area that uh, uh, hasn't been studied a lot. Uh, respiratory compromise or post-operative respiratory failure, I think, is well studied. But um, we at Duke got interested in uh, a more uh, 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 what unusual area, or I shouldn't say unusual, unstudied area uh, out on the general care floor in just general care patients. So uh, with a grant from the Respiratory Care, uh, excuse me, Compromise Institute, um, we were able to do some interesting analyses that I'm going to share with you today. So in the next 30 minutes or so. So disclosures, always have to give disclosures. There are a couple of vent companies in there uh, uh, that have no impact on my topic today. Uh, in all fairness, I am one of the at-large members on the Respiratory it says Care Institute, it should be Compromise Institute. Phil, I apologize. I got respiratory care on the brain. <laughs> the Respiratory Compromise Institute. And uh, again, I want to address that area of, uh, of care, the general care area, and speak about mon monitoring strategies and risk stratification in that area. So what I want to do, as I say, over the next 30 minutes is just talk about what we mean by respiratory compromise and why it's important. Uh, the first study we did at the Institute was to look at Medicare claims data. I'll briefly review that for you. And then I'm going to focus, like I said, on the work we have done at Duke on what we called uh, or the, what we've titled unplanned intubations. And then uh, finally some comments about where I think we need to go in this field. So what do we mean by respiratory compromise? Um, my definition, a deterioration in respiratory function from either a normal state or a chronic stable state uh, that puts the patient at risk for respiratory failure, needing life support technology, or even death. Um, hard to get your arms around how often this occurs uh, outside of the intensive care unit, um, but respiratory failure requiring emergency mechanical ventilation in one survey uh, was about 44,000 patients a year in the United States. Uh, about 1% of all surgical patients, this is a much more carefully studied area, uh, requires an unplanned post-operative intubation. Uh, the importance of this is that if this happens to you, it's really bad. Uh, mortality rates uh, in the literature uh, exceeding 40%. So what is this Respiratory Compromise Institute that uh, uh, was formed really to sort of address this issue? Uh, it's an alliance of 12 professional societies societies that I suspect most of you in the room are members of. Uh, its mission is to provide education and to support research and other projects to understand this problem. And as I say, it's only been around a couple of years. Um, there was a consensus conference uh, trying to get the ball rolling back in 2015. There are three funded research programs, either completed or ongoing, and a number of publications. Uh, it's funded by industry, uh, but these are unrestricted grants to the Institute uh, and for the Institute to disperse as it sees fit. So there's, uh, it, it has industry money, we have to be honest. Having said that, uh, there's some pretty impressive firewalls in, in, in place to make sure it operates as an independent uh, entity. Okay, uh, the first project was just to look at what are called Medicare claims data. Um, this is a very broad way of looking at uh, healthcare utilization. Um, the pros of doing big studies like this are to look at uh, sort of the real world situation. Uh, you get a large population, the data is already there, uh, and you can get huge amounts of uh, data over long periods of time. Um, the downside, it's only Medicare patients. Uh, it's primarily billing data, so it's not focused on clinical uh, information uh, per se. And um, you base your you base your analyses on how patients, or excuse me, how patients are coded. So it, it, it's, it's a broad, imprecise way of looking at something. But anyway, just to um, let you know uh, what this revealed, the way it's done is you actually take only 5% of the actual Medicare data uh, in a given time period. Um, it's because the database is so enormous, 5% uh, is about as much as a modern computer can handle at a reasonable period of time. And 5% actually is a pretty good representation of the Medicare population. Uh, the, in, the period we were interested in was from 2012 to 2014. I'm not going to go through all the codes we used and how we sorted and shifted it. Um, but the, these are the codes uh, that were of interest to us in this analysis. 
Uh, we broke the group uh, this, uh, into two cohorts. Uh, and medical DRGs, we found 16,000 patients that met our criteria for developing respiratory failure after, after being in a hospital. So these were not patients who came in in respiratory failure. These were patients who developed respiratory failure in the hospital. And uh, almost the same amount in the surgical uh, arena, 13,000 patients with a surgical DRG. So uh, this, uh, this is a pretty good sized number. The important thing is the mortality for developing respiratory failure in the hospital is significantly worse than if you come in with it. So if you come in uh, uh, with a problem and things go sour on you, uh, the mortality uh, is, uh, is substantial. So just to kind of summarize this first study, uh, 40,000 patients annually are, uh, uh, met these criteria. Um, and it is more common than admissions for respiratory failure. Uh, the underlying risk factors are, are, are not surprising. Older patients see cardiovascular disease and sepsis. And again, just to reemphasize, the mortality is uh, higher than if you come in with respiratory failure. So with that backdrop, I want to get into what we specifically did at Duke, uh, because that's really the focus of my discussion with you today. And what we wanted to do is look at a very discrete population. The population that you and I said, they're safe. They're safe. They don't need monitoring. We can put them on a general care floor. We don't have to worry about them. And yet, and we were interested in that population to see uh, what the respiratory compromise issues were in that population. So we label this, just for ease, uh, unplanned intubations on general care wards. So again, severe, unexpected respiratory compromise, what I call the extreme of respiratory compromise, uh, requiring an urgent insertion of an endotracheal tube on a general care floor. Uh, these patients had to have been there at least 24 hours uh, and at least 24 hours away from discharge from an ICU or a surgical procedure. And we were interested, as I say, these were patients who, uh, when you think about it, were deemed safe. These patients were safe. They didn't need step down, they didn't need intensive monitoring, they didn't need ICUs. And we were interested in how often does this occur? Uh, what are the characteristics of these patients? What was being monitored in these patients, if anything? And uh, we were, uh, what I thought was a really cool analysis, we looked at the vital sign trajectory in the uh, 12 hours prior to the event. Were there warning signs being sent up? So the inclusion criteria, we're a big medical center. Uh, we have three hospitals, uh, and uh, uh, again, on general medicine or surgery floors greater than 24 hours after admission uh, and 24 hours post-surgery if a surgical patient. And we did this over a three-year period of time. Uh, DNR orders or airways already in place were obvious exclusions. So the case definition, uh, we used a, a, a number of different criteria to describe this population. I won't go that, into that in great detail. Uh, but we found 448 patients over this period of time, uh, this three-year period of time. And if you do the math on this by beds, that means 69 events per year per 1,000 beds. So if you have a 1,000-bed hospital, uh, you can count on these events occurring about uh, two, or excuse me, three every two weeks or one and a half every week give or take a few. So, and if you multiply this by the yearly admissions in the United States, that translates into 69,000 events per year. Uh, that's, uh, that's an important number. Uh, granted, it's small uh, by other criteria, by, uh, compared to other disease states, but it's 69,000 patients who, at least at the time, were not deemed at risk for dying or having a, a need for an endotracheal tube. And as I said before, uh, in our population, the mortality was even higher. We had a 49% mortality in that population. Uh, we selected uh, several thousand control patients. Uh, these were patients who uh, were on the same wards at the same time, um, but who did not suffer a respiratory compromise. Uh, and uh, this ended up being some 20,000 patients, uh, and their mortality rate was, uh, as you might expect, quite low. So aim one was to quantify the demographics and clinical characteristics in the cases versus the controls. 
and then try to look again at this 24 hours just before the event occurred. So let's look at AIM-1. Uh, there are not surprises here. There are not surprises here. Uh, they tended to be uh, smokers. Uh, their, surprisingly, their alcohol use was lower. But uh, the typical chronic diseases you expect uh, in general medicine, uh, general care wards. It was kind of interesting that 71% of these people actually were admitted through the ED. Now, they were stable and on a general care floor, but they were uh, emergency admissions, which was markedly higher uh, than what we had in the control group. Important diagnoses uh, and medication use. Again, no real surprises here. Uh, there was a higher incidence of things that you might expect to put patients at high risk, but you'll notice the numbers are not huge. Uh, there's no obvious signal jumping out at you here. Um, people worry about opioids and sedatives, and I think that's a reasonable thing to worry about, but at least in our population, uh, only about a third of them were on sedatives or opioids, and that was only a little bit higher than the patients who were in the control group. So I'm, I'm not here to disclaim or say that opioids and sedatives are not a risk. I'm, I'm, I'm sure they are. But what I'm trying to point out here is that these events are occurring in a lot of patients who are not on opioids and sedatives. I find it interesting that on the, over the course of their admission in the hospital, everybody got oxygen. <laughs> I, I, I thought that was rather striking. Um, that doesn't mean they had it for very long, uh, but if there was any order for oxygen during their entire stay, um, uh, they got uh, labeled here. So oxygen seems to be a uh, wildly popular drug. So that's uh, kind of a snapshot of what they looked like. And then as I say, what I was really interested in was uh, uh, what happened, what happened to them uh, in the hours just before the admission. So in the 12 hours prior to the admission, 36% uh, were on opioids. Again, not the majority, not the majority. Um, the monitoring is rather striking, isn't it? Uh, very few of them were on any kind of sophisticated monitor except the all-encompassing uh, pulse oximeter. Everybody's got a pulse oximeter. That doesn't mean people were looking at it or listening to it, but, but they were there. So capnography and telemetry are uh, very, very rarely done. Uh, a few of them were on uh, uh, BiPAP or high-flow nasal cannulas. I don't know about your hospitals, but um, those are unusual on general care floors uh, uh, because of various and sundry policies. I don't have to go into that. Uh, but that was not a very common uh, uh, situation. These are just average vital sign trajectories. So this is just taking all 448 of them, and the black line are the 20,000 control groups uh, over a random 12-hour period. And um, as you can see, the pulse, average pulse, doesn't change a whole bunch. The average pulse is higher by almost eight beats a minute, but it doesn't change in the 12 hours, uh, excuse me, 24 hours uh, on these graphs prior to the admission. The respiratory rate's an interesting signal. This is not a new finding. I think most of you are aware of the, uh, a number of studies have suggested that uh, a respiratory rate, particularly tachypnea, uh, is a harbinger of bad things, and our data certainly supports that. Uh, the pulse oximetry uh, does drop a little bit, but you'll notice it doesn't drop a lot, uh, down into the low 90s, and uh, the blood pressure really doesn't change much at all. Now these are just averages. This is looking at the whole group. Uh, and I wanted to cut this, and we cut this data uh, a little more carefully to see exactly how many patients did have a significant change in a vital sign. So interestingly enough, respirations, 11% uh, actually dropped their respiratory rate in the 12 hours, or excuse me, 24 hours prior to admission, uh, the event. 16% went up, uh, a couple of them dropped, uh, 12% or 11% or so uh, had their blood pressure significantly lower, uh, and uh, maybe about 6% actually had it go up. The pulse oximeter did drop in about 12%. Uh, it actually went up in 5%. Uh, the temperature was kind of interesting. It didn't change at all. So this does give you an, some insight, I think, uh, that there are signals there in some patients. But what was really interesting to me is that almost half the patients had nothing. Half the patients had absolutely nothing. These were patients sitting there smoking and joking, as my team likes to say. Uh, pulse, blood pressure, 
pulse oximetry, everything, rock solid. And yet, out of the blue, comes a need to be intubated. This is a fascinating population uh, that we really know very little about. No warning whatsoever. So our conclusions from this study uh, is that extreme re um, respiratory compromise does occur. And at least if you extrapolate our data, it's about 69,000 times a year in the United States. Uh, older men with significant comorbidities, no surprise there. But what's bothersome is there was no clear signal that uh, this, is, this is the real warning sign here. Um, in the 12 hours prior to the intubation, uh, sedatives and opioids were being used, but not in the majority. And it really doesn't seem to, uh, there's more going on than just patients having sedative and opioid issues. Clinicians, as I say, were obviously unconcerned about these patients. They were on general care wards, uh, on very little intensive monitoring except for the pulse oximeter, uh, and just routine vital signs. And uh, these trends did show some changes occurring, but again, I reemphasize the fact that almost half of them had no warning signs whatsoever. So where do we go from, this, uh, fr fr from these data? Where, what, what are our future directions here? Make sure I stay on time here. Um, uh, I want to, I, I would like to build on this uh, evolving evidence base. Uh, I really would like to be able to describe the actual trajectory of these patients, especially those 46% who, at least on the surface, really didn't have much of anything going on. Uh, obviously, I'd like to expand this uh, further down the road into other settings. We were just looking at general care wards. Um, costs are, everybody wants to evaluate cost effects, and maybe we can if we look deeper into these patients, we might come up with something. So when you think about the disease states at risk, um, the three big categories that jump out at you are the neurologic, the cardiovascular, and the respiratory, and we might throw into that uh, a systemic inflammatory process as well. But the neurologic patients are those who have an impairment of the control of breathing or airway protection. The cardiovascular patients are obviously those who have an impairment of perfusion, and the respiratory are severe impairment of ventilation and VQ matching. And I'd like to describe what I call phenotypes. Basically, the three big categories, neurologic, cardiovascular, and respiratory, and break them into what I call the sudden acute catastrophic. Classic examples, the patient sitting in bed who develops a stroke right before your very eyes. The patient who develops an acute myocardial infarction and has a uh, lethal arrhythmia right before your eyes or goes into shock. The respiratory events, the aspirations, the emboli, the pneumothorax, the bronchospasm. And then another category or another sort of group or phenotype would be those with gradual deterioration. The classic example here would be neurologic, drugs uh, and, and the like gradually building up uh, the cardiovascular, the fluid overloads, the drugs, the respiratory infections, sepsis, and ARDS. I kind of suspect, I kind of suspect that the first category, the sudden, unexpected, catastrophic, are going to be those patients who did not have a change in vital signs. And that's a very difficult problem to get our arms around, and it's 46% of the group. I think more easy, we're going to have a better time getting risk profiles and monitoring strategies for the second group, the gradual deteriorations. Uh, obviously, I don't know that for sure. That's why we want to pursue the, uh, uh, the what, what I call a deep dive into these patients to see uh, exactly what is going on. But uh, this is what I'm hoping for the future uh, to, uh, to, be able to, uh, to, to be able to study and look at and see what's going on here. As I say, it'd be nice to uh, go out into other areas. We're talking about the emergency department, the fresh admissions uh, right out of the ED, uh, and the transfers from the ICU. Uh, I think that transfer from the ICU population would be a really interesting group to look at. We specifically excluded that group here, uh, but uh, uh, future studies, I would like to include them because I think that's a very important category. Everybody wants to know cost. These are very difficult studies to try to do. Um, to be honest with you, I'm a clinician. Yeah, I know I'm supposed to be worried about costs, and I, I, I am. But uh, at the end of the day, I'm much more interested in trying to figure out how to treat these patients better uh, than I am trying to save money. But 
Having said that, yes, I know, we all want to save money. And then, of course, the ultimate model is to build uh, some kind of valid, uh, uh, validate some kind of scoring systems, especially in that 46% who, well, it's going to be different risk prediction models, obviously, in the graduals versus the sudden acutes. But uh, I think the ability to dive deep into these patients will give us the ability to perhaps come up with some legitimate uh, ways to perhaps anticipate these things better. So the goal really, when you think about it, is to, it, it's, it's sort of a two, well, I've got three steps here, but a, a multi-step process, identify the high risk group. We are not monitoring these people at all, or at least nothing more than routine vital signs. So. Uh, if you, you, it's obviously impractical uh, to, to, to put fancy monitors on everybody, uh, but if you could identify the high risk group, and then secondly, uh, effective monitoring tools. I was in the exhibit hall earlier today. Uh, a lot of the manufacturers are out there with various toys uh, looking at different ways of monitoring. Uh, the, the popular ones now, of course, well, everybody does pulse oximetry, but, the sort of emerging ones that people get interested in are things like uh, uh, CO2 monitoring, exhaled CO2 monitoring, uh, and respiratory pattern, respiratory pattern monitoring. I showed you our data on uh, respiratory rate. Um, there's some interest in including tidal volume on that. Uh, and uh, uh, not just looking for tachypnea or bradypnea, but looking for tachypnea and, uh, and small tidal volumes. And, uh, and using it as a combination kind of a, a monitoring tool. Uh, those are things that are being talked about a lot. And as I say, as you wander through the exhibit hall, uh, there will be plenty of people in there who would just love to show you uh, various toys. Uh, these monitors are expensive. Uh, again, we can't, rec we, we can't jump in feet first and say everybody on general care floor needs all this fancy stuff. That's obviously not going to happen. But if we can identify high-risk patients, um, I think some of these monitors can really, really help us. And then monitoring is no good uh, unless you can act on it. Uh, it's all well and good to say Mr. Smith is having this, that, and the other thing, but unless you can jump in and help Mr. Smith, uh, waiting for the RRT to be called is probably too late. So I left about six minutes here on my watch. Um, what I've tried to Oh, give you an overview of is this notion of what is respiratory compromise? Why is it important? Um, it is important because, as I say, it, it afflicts a lot of patients and, uh, uh, and it carries with it a very high mortality. Uh, the Medicare claims was an, a, a broad 30,000 foot view uh, that uh, uh, supports the notion that this is a serious problem and respiratory failure on admission is not as dangerous, actually, as respiratory failure in the hospital. Our study looking at this very focused, focused group of what are thought to be safe, stable patients uh, revealed some interesting things. Uh, uh, again, 69, or our data suggests as many as 69,000 patients. Um, half of them may be having vital signs or other signs that might give us a warning of a gradual deterioration, but another half seemingly things just coming out of the blue at you. Uh, so two different broad, if you will, phenotypes uh, that uh, I think are worthy of future study. And again, I gave you my sort of peek into the future of what, uh, of what could be there for future monitoring and risk stratification. So George, I left, like I said, a couple of minutes. Yeah, I got about seven or minutes on mine. Um, happy to entertain questions or comments or suggestions. Yes. Uh, you routinely, once should uh, check the Balam Party score? I, I have been in practice for many, many years, and I'm on the faculty of UCLA. Uh, I noticed even the nurses or oh. the house staff, they don't pay attention. We teach them to look at the just prior to intubation or prior to bronchoscopy in this group. If you add as one of the very important component obesity and Balam Party score, anybody who has three or four, they are destined to get into problem. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful comment. And, uh, uh, but I'm going to underscore the problem. Um, as we went through our database uh, looking at, we looked at OSA, uh, we looked at obesity, uh, and there was slightly more in our intubation group, but not nearly as many as I thought there would be. A lot of the control group had obesity and, and sleep apnea as well. 
Um, but you're right, in the vital signs or even on the initial assessment as you come to the wards, uh, they, that uh, assessment of the airways, this, the mom potty score, as you, as you suggest, never done. Never done, at least not in our institution. So I think it's a great idea. Uh, we got a ways to go. Yes, in the back. Yeah, I'm Julie Pontrell Evans, Director of Respiratory Service at St. Joseph's Medical Center in Stockton. Um, did you notice when you were doing your deep dive if there was a correlation between the unplanned intubations and an increased uh, rapid response calls? In other words, if you had more rapid response calls, you had a decrease in unplanned intubations, uh, catching the patient earlier? Uh, f first off, we haven't taken that deep of a dive yet. Having said that, uh, RRTs, Again, we have these sort of two phenotypes, uh, the rapid, or excuse me, the, the gradual decline, and there were a number of RRTs in that group that ended up with an intubation. In the sudden crash and burns, um, RRTs uh, it, were replaced by code teams, um, as you might expect. Uh, but um, the, we, we, we haven't fully explored the role of the RRT. There's a lot of controversy in I hate the term RRT because they keep thinking of a registered respiratory therapist. <laughs> <laughs> but the rapid response teams, as I'm sure you know, are, uh, uh, have, have gotten mixed reviews. Um, there, are many, there are positive studies out there that say if these are well executed with clear uh, uh, <coughs> intervention protocols, they can be effective. But uh, they have to be constructed properly. Uh, but it, thank you for bringing it up. Uh, we are writing a grant for the future to look at these things more, and uh, uh, our RRTs probably would be a good idea to look at more carefully. Thank you. Neil? Yes? Do you have an educated guess as to how many of these 47% were going to die anyway? I, I don't know how else to say it. I used to say 87 years old. Now I'll say 97. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I mean, we have discussed this at the, at the Respiratory Compromise yeah. Institute, and there is a certain nihilism that uh, that half that doesn't have warning signs, uh, it comes at you out of the blue, may be unsalvageable. Um, I'm not quite ready to give up on them yet, uh, but we won't know until we look at them more carefully. Thank you for this uh, wonderful presentation. As an ICU physician who also does inpatient pulmonary and attend to RRT and code blue, I can tell you most of the uh, people, just like the OSA and the melon party and respiratory rate is not carefully looked on. It's not. It's a cumulative fluid balance. I mean, just over the years, as patients come in, NPO, on fluids, as a guesstimate, not like surgeons per ml per kg body weight, you start like 100, 120, and then nobody thinks about it. And the next thing you know, is like three liters to 10 liters. And I've seen just too many of those things. And I think we need to educate our medical students, residents, fellows, and obviously uh, practicing physicians that that's a huge, huge issue. Oh, the fluid balance story uh, has gone on for decades. And, and uh, the wet team and the dry team. And uh, wet lungs are very, uh, or dry lungs are very happy lungs, but uh, dry kidneys are very sad indeed. And, uh, <laughs> And, and, and the argument goes on and on and on, and the pendulum swings back and forth. But I do agree with you that uh, there is a, a, a it, it's, it's almost like fluids can't hurt, uh, but they can. Uh, it's, I, and I don't have time to go into it, but oxygen can hurt. And it, it actually bothers me that 100% of our patients had oxygen at some point. 100%. Actually, I think it was 99.9. .9. That means there was some poor schmo down at the end of the hall that for some reason didn't get oxygen, but, but 100%, and I mean, this is another topic unto itself, but hyperoxia, so hyperfluidemia, is that a good word? And hyperoxia, um, these are things that I think many of us uh, just sort of take for granted as being benign, but they're not, but they're not. And uh, yes, on our, our, our next proposal, fluid balance uh, is going to be looked at on each individual, because I think you're right. If I come back and visit you in two years with uh, more data, maybe we'll, yeah. Yeah. part two. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, do you know if hospital day was significant? So Say is again? this like, a, uh, hospital day was significant for unplanned. So is this like day one, day two, maybe we mistriage them from the ED? This, no, this, or is this day at least 21? this population was all at least 24 hours after right. being there. 
Uh, so like we wanted a certain period of stability, and if they had come from an ICU or from an operating room, they had to be at least 24 hours out of the step-down units and the PACUs. Okay. Okay. Dr. McIntyre, oh, thank wait, you. Wait, I got one more. Last question, please. Yeah. ICU post 24 hours had any change in their fluid balance? Well, I think it, it comes right. back to, to the point here. This is not something we were able to capture from a sort of global perspective, which is what our first analysis was. But in our second analysis, where we're going to go back and look at these 448 people much more carefully, <coughs> fluid balance, and I'm going to throw in, the, right. if I can find it, <laughs> um, Malampati scars. So you guys have been very helpful to me. I, <laughs> I'm going to come back here more. <laughs> Okay, thank you all very much for your attention. Thanks.